Hi, welcome to Donna's Intermittent Fasting Journal, broadcast number 45. <clears throat> I'm especially excited. You know, I'm always excited, right? I'm always excited. I know that. But I'm especially excited today uh, to bring you <clears throat> not, unfortunately, not tons and tons of answers as much as just hope because um, you know how excited I get in general about the fact that I'm able to bring information to people that has changed my life. I mean, that that it's just the best job in the world to be able to give information to somebody that could change their lives <clears throat> in a way that's similar to how it has changed my life. It, it, it's just life-changing. <laughs> but what I'm going to talk about today with premenstrual syndrome, with PMS, with cyclical weight gain and cravings and so forth, is um, very, very near and dear to me. It's something that uh, I've been able to overcome a lot of through intermittent fasting, through healthy supplementation, through just getting old, <laughs> right? <clears throat> but it's something that definitely um, I lived with for many, many, many years. And so um, I, like I said, maybe, I, maybe I'm going to have this 1500 word outline <laughs> And um, and I'm and I'm going to end this, and you're going to be saying, "Well, I didn't really know what to do, but I, but if I even give you hope, I'll be happy." Um, but I do have a lot of information too, because <laughs> you know me, I'm a teacher. So anyway, welcome. Um, I want to remind you before I get into the information today about upcoming webinars. Uh, in the next two weeks, we'll have four intermittent fasting webinars answering the 10 intermittent fasting questions. So you can hop on over to intermittentfastingcourse.com and sign up for one of those free hour long webinar sessions. And April 1st, we'll start our next course group. So uh, amazing results the last couple of months. I've been very, very blessed uh, to actually have two medical doctors and uh, two or three um, doctors of psychology and pharmacy and other areas uh, be in my courses in the last couple of months. And so I've been able to get feedback from them. So that has been uh, really exciting to me to get to get positive feedback from them, um, as well as all course attendees. So anyway, uh, first of all, we all know about PMS. We know that it happens every month. We a different different for different people. It's different days and times as far as like, you know, starts here. It ends here. I'm better on this day. <sighs> this is my day of relief. You know, that might be different or that is different for different people. Um, and I won't claim to be an expert in the process. Uh, you have to remember that I was pregnant and or nursing 14 years out of 17. So I didn't have any PMS. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> that's crazy. So 14 out of 17, over a 17 year period, I was either nursing or pregnant. Sorry about that. I was either nursing or pregnant 14 years of the 17. So what a relief that was not to be, not to, <laughs> not to have PMS. No, I didn't just get pregnant not to have PMS. But anyway, um, so I don't understand all of the mechanics behind it. Um, I do know what causes pregnancy and how to avoid it, even though you might not think I do. I do. Um, but I but this is what I know. For one thing, I knew that I know that in my diet history, I had two downfalls. Uh, I had many downfalls, but I had two big ones. And the first one, it was weekends. So even if I managed to get control of myself during the week and I managed to, you know, lose weight. Maybe I stayed on my carbs. <clears throat> Maybe I stayed on my very low calorie diet. Maybe I stayed on HCG. Maybe I stayed on way down. Maybe I stayed on calorie counting. Uh, Maybe I stayed on low fat, whatever it was. If I managed to do that during the week, the weekend would come and it would all be gone. <clears throat> and I know that that I hear that over and over and over again in weight loss circles. And I know that that's a common problem. And we have tools in intermittent fasting to help with that. And so that has changed a lot. I still enjoy the weekends and I still, you know, celebrate with my kids and, and, you know, do festive type of things. One of uh, my husband's students just took us out for dinner last night and their family. It was delightful. We enjoy those things very much, 
but I don't have to wreck it all on the weekends anymore because of intermittent fasting. My eating window is, um, even if it's six or seven or eight hours on a special occasion, it's still lower than it would be if I weren't fasting. Um, I didn't, I don't go like completely crazy like I used to. Remember the old way, how Friday would come or Thursday night even in some cases, and we would start the binging and we wouldn't stop until Monday, right? So that has really changed dramatically for me with intermittent fasting. With the, um, you know, control of insulin, the control of leptin, ghrelin, all of, you know, the human growth hormone, the exercises that I've been able to um, incorporate and so forth. So that has changed a lot. The other thing that used to be a big downfall for me and still is is a little bit of a struggle. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more because I'm pretty old. But the thing that I the thing that I did not understand about um, uh, the monthly cravings and weight gain and PMS and all of that was I did not understand how. Uh, how I could still have those type of things even after I'm through menopause. So evidently it never leaves you. So anyway, um, but the second thing was my monthly cravings and weight gain. And the, the thing about this is that I thought that I was the only one. I don't know why we think we're the only one in things, but I thought I was the only one who actually, um, you know, could do really well and actually be losing weight and, and, uh, you know, staying on whatever diet it was until PMS struck. And then everything was thrown out the window and I would gain back anything that I'd previously lost. Come to find out, many, many women feel this way. And many, many women have that same experience month after month after month where they're doing great, they're eating healthfully, they're losing weight. And then all of a sudden, they ovulation hits or whatever their bad time is the beginning of their bad time is for them. So what causes it? Speaking of hormones, Wendy, what causes it? There are uh, numerous um, things that are speculated. And um, I will say that one of the things that is speculated is that it's a learned behavior. And I don't agree with that because I've experienced it too much for it just to be a learned behavior. I didn't, I wasn't just waiting for a certain time of the month to come along every month all throughout my uh, menstrual cycles, waiting for a certain time of the month to come along so I could be mean, <laughs> so I could hate myself, so I could eat everything in sight, so I could feel out of control, so I could feel hopeless. I mean, who, who why, would, why, would, why would that be a learned behavior? So I don't agree with that, but I wanted to tell you that it's out there. Um, and I think people saying, that something is a learned behavior or something isn't real when it when we know it's real can be you know very hurtful and it can be very demoralizing to somebody who's trying to find a solution in their life right i mean so you're just doing that because it's a learned behavior you think you need chocolate because it's that time of the month um no no not really <laughs> so anyway that is what some people say um i believe that it has a lot to do with serotonin levels and serotonin is the feel-good hormone that we've heard about. Uh, we know that antidepressants are prescribed to people to raise serotonin levels. I personally take natural uh, plant-based supplements that indirectly affect serotonin. As a matter of fact, one of my products that I take that I've talked about here before, Metaburn, um, has 5-HTP, um, which you can get by itself also, and you are not supposed to take 5-HTP at the same time as you take uh, a, a serotonin uh, increase or, or an antidepressant because it's it's got those same properties. The reason that I believe that the serotonin theory is correct is because whenever I, uh, I don't know, I think I've, I think I had like my fifth child or something, and um, I finally decided to go on medication for PMS. And, um, the medication that I went on two weeks out of every month was an antidepressant. And it 
turned my PMS around and I took it two weeks out of the month. I knew, you know, when at the time, because I was still, I hadn't gone through menopause, obviously I was, I just had my fifth child. So I hadn't gone through menopause. So I knew exactly when to start it and I knew when to stop it. So I just took it two weeks a month and it was an antidepressant, but it was used for PMS. And that's why I believe the serotonin, um, the serotonin theory is probably accurate. And um, so with the serotonin theory, the serotonin, your serotonin levels are lower during PMS. And those, of course, are the feel-good chemicals in the brain. And our body uses carbohydrates to make serotonin. And this is one reason why we have a tendency to get really grouchy, irritable when we take our carbs too low because carbs help us feel good. <laughs> even healthy carbs help us feel good. I'm not talking about a temporary feel good through processed foods. I'm talking about a, a real feel good through um, healthy carbs. So um, we, because of this um, low lower, lowering of serotonin levels, we crave sugar and starches and snacky foods um, because we need those carbs to raise our serotonin levels. And, um, just from my experience, having been on antidepressants to help with PMS, that makes a lot of sense to me. There's, you know, there are a lot of other hormones that are being imbalanced at that time. Estrogen levels are high during the mid cycle, and that causes us to seek more feel good foods and activities. Um, you know, causes us, you know, if that's what causes us to curl up and, you know, for the weekend and watch Netflix all weekend because we don't have any energy or we don't have any, um, our moods are so low. Uh, you know, it could be that too. There are also some other things that um, are speculated. Chocolate cravings could be a uh, craving for caffeine. And the, the latter two, the cravings for caffeine and the need for magnesium and the need for chromium, those could be just not, not just during PMS. Those could actually be taking place anytime if we're having other cravings. So sugar cravings could be a deficiency in magnesium um, or chromium. So, um, that is that can be an issue too and it's important to know and as i go through here i'm gonna you're gonna keep hearing me say do whatever you can during the good times right do whatever you can do during the good times to make it better during the hard times right so as we go through uh, this list of things and as we look at how can we prepare for this time of the month how can we come out of this time of the month successful rather than feeling like that just undid everything I've ever tried to do for the whole month. And, you know, all my hard work is down the drain and feeling so bad about ourselves uh, as a result of that um, is, is what the goal is going to be. So one of the things that we can do is what can we do ahead of time? So we can, you know, if we need caffeine, you know, use caffeine. If we are short in magnesium, short in chromium, if we, you know, need to change food habits and things like that to set up for that time, um, then we can do that ahead of time, right? We can, you, you ever think about how on the weekend, like if you're really, really doing badly eating and you always think to yourself, well, on Monday, I'm going to do this, this, and this, and maybe we even make a list in the phone of the foods we're going to get and, and everything we're going to do on Monday, and it's so easy to think out that time. The research on this is super, super compelling. I just, you know, how we are so optimistic that we can do something in the future, right? And we've all felt this. I mean, every one of us. I mean, I feel this way every night. Tomorrow, tomorrow I'm going to, you know, get this accomplished or, or you know, do better at this or do more reps or get more writing done or teach better. I mean, it's not just with food, it's with everything that we always look to the future and we think that's going to be better later. Well, this is actually one case where we really should pre-prepare, so to speak. So plan ahead for that. Um, so obviously, like I said, everybody has different starts and stops times. For me, you know, I know it was really bad like at ovulation and then it got a little bit better for a few days and then it peaked again until um, I started menstruating. So that, that part of it is going to be a very individualized thing as to when are your really bad days? When are you, do you feel out of control food wise? And those are going to be things that we're going to want to know. Like after a while I knew, you know, exactly what was going on. So, um, you know, and I would know which days were going to be, we're going to be which things. And, you know, when we're in the moment, we're not going to be able to solve all these things. 
because these are very, very real things that come over us, right? They're not learned behaviors and they're not something that we're just going to buck up, right? And so because of that, anything we can do ahead of time is going to help with that. All right, so uh, I have some general steps to counteract it. I have some uh, miscellaneous ideas and I have some food ideas. <clears throat> I will say um, before I start into the food ideas, the food ideas that I have are coming from the approach of good, better, best. Best of all is always eating real food, not you know, eating the trifecta as I like trifecta, as I like to say, the sugar, uh, flour, and fat combo. It's you know not indulging in you know processed foods too much, and keeping those instances of really really seductive foods spread out. I've talked about that and the dopamine um, hit that we get from having that too frequently. Um, that's always the best. But when we're talking about something that feels like it's completely out of our control and something that is happening to us as opposed to us being able to do it, then I'm not looking at best and I'm not looking at better. I'm looking at good enough. And so what if, you know, just substituting vanilla wafers is better, is, is good enough? Um, so anyway, I say that to say that this would not be my typical food advice. My typical food advice is get fasting 16, 18, 19 hours a day so that you can control your insulin, you can control your ghrelin, you can hear your leptin, and then you can make all kinds of good food changes. But it doesn't work with PMS to just tell people, just do better. Just eat less sugar. Just don't eat that. Just don't go through the drive through I, I know from experience that it's so overwhelming that you can't just give tried advice. And while intermittent fasting has been phenomenal to help me with my uh, bad days, my healthy supplementation, actually three years ago when I started my healthy supplementation, I went from five, four or five bad days a month to like two. With intermittent fasting, I'm down to one or even half a one. So I know that, it, but I'm old too, right? <laughs> so, but I'm saying this to say, I, I don't want to give tried advice to just do better, be better, you know, be strong um, during, in this, okay? All right, so first of all, don't start fasting or working out or changing your eating protocol during this time. I listened to some trainers uh, talk about this. I, I listened and read a lot. I always do before each broadcast, but um, I was really surprised to hear male trainers talking about how they talk to their female. Now these are um, competitive um, bodybuilders and competitive physique physique competitors and um, how they look at the calendar with their female uh, competitors and they purposely plan their entire workout schedule around their PMS. And it, it was just, it was so enlightening, you know, so much, so much better than hearing somebody say, just, you know, buck up. And they said, the bottom line is they can't do what they can't do during this time. And so they alter their, their workout, their training schedule. So, you know, so that their lighter days are during the time that they, you know, lack motivation, their favorite things are during that time. They're, they're trying to set them up for as much success as they possibly can during this PMS time. And, um, and they're not starting anything new putting, you know, getting a whole new uh, methodology, a whole new exercise regime, a whole new protocol for food. They're not doing that during this time. This is not the time to do that. This is the time to do as great, as good as you can do. Do as good as you can do. That did not sound very medically correct. This is not the time to try all these new things. All right, next, watch your calendar closely for the worst days, the okay days, and the recovery days. These days will be important to your food, your motivation, your mood, and more. So you want to get ahead of them. You want to know they're coming so that you can uh, be ready for them. And the other thing about 
in general is if we could just outside of the PMS time even get the, the words and the thinking of cheat days out of our vocabulary. Um, I have, I have, I'm preparing a broadcast on this actually because um, just as a little aside, um, oh, I have it here. Uh, one of the pieces of research uh, wasn't just one, it was repeated research, which is always better, right? I, I talked about that on my research um, broadcast, but the, the research shows that cheat days usually consist of twice as many calories as you typically consume. So um, without doing all the math, like I'm going to do my cheat day video, uh, if you have a 2000 calorie maintenance and then you have a 4000 calorie cheat day, which is what, what research shows is usually the case, and you do that for two days, you can't create a calorie deficit with cheat days. Now, I'm, this is just not even PMS related, just in general. In general, you cannot ever create the calorie deficit that you need to get to your goal weight. We can't. I'm speaking to myself too. I just had a couple cheat days uh, when I was on a writing retreat um, with my daughter. Um, so I'm preaching to the choir here. We cannot get the deficit that we need to get to our goal weight and to maintain our goal weight when we have cheat days. It's just too calorically dense. It can't happen. And especially if we string a couple together, which is usually what happens with cheat days because of the dopamine spikes that I mentioned earlier from the processed foods. So <clears throat> we're not going to be able to undo that. So if we go into our PMS thinking, and, and, and I'm not saying it's a learned behavior, but if we go into it thinking, well, I can't do anything about it anyway, so I'm just going to throw caution to the wind and I'll just wait until it's all over. <laughs> when it subsides, then I'll hit it again. You know, then I'll get back on it. If we can eliminate the cheat days vocabulary and the cheat days way of thinking from our way of thinking in our vocab um, before we get into the PMS, then instead of looking at those days as cheat days, you know, we can look at them as maybe survival days or maybe, you know, uh, okay days, you know, okay, good, better, best, you know, but, but the soon as we ascribe cheat days to those days, then then we shift our thinking from trying to do anything that we could do to control it to instead just throwing in the towel entirely and those cheat days add up and they can't be recouped, which is why all of us who had weight loss during half the month and not and then weight gain during the second half of the or the other half of the month all throughout our dieting years did not lose weight. So um, don't throw in the towel and call them cheat days. Uh, cheat days during cycle issues become cheat weeks and you will undo everything. So I'm going to get more into the food in just a minute. But when your motivation and control are high, so the non-PMS times, right? When those motivations, and, and we all have them. Like I know I used to just be like, for me, my, um, my PMS and everything was relieved and I was like, Oh, I can do anything again, you know, kind of thing. I was always an optimist. Um, the minute I started my menstrual cycle, right? So then at that time, when I'm feeling so positive and I have my motivation high, that is when we, and my control was better, that is when we need to make superb fasting, eating, and movement decisions, okay? During that time, that is when we need to do all of those things. Sorry, I need another note. Okay, so um, don't wane when you're not being affected by your cycle, right? And, and I know that it takes a lot all the time to keep up at the pace that we want to keep up to get to our goal weight, to get to our goal size, to exercise the way we want, to to work at the level we want to work at, or whatever we want to do. I know it takes a lot to get there, 
But when you have the motivation and you have the drive and you have the inspiration and, and you have the capability of doing it, that's when you really, really need to hit it hard. So don't wane when we're not being affected by our cycle. And also, this is super important. I'm going to put a star beside this so that I can hold on it or something later. But you have to remember that whenever your motivation is high and you're not in a PMS scenario and you are doing well, that's the real you. And that's one reason why I had no trouble going on PMS medication. And I was on it for like 15 years. I had no trouble doing that from my fifth child until, um, I don't know, a few years ago, actually. And I had no trouble doing that because I knew that wasn't the real me. The real me is the one who's not affected by those low serotonin levels and that the high estrogen levels and whatever else was happening during that time. The real me is, is the motivated me. The real me is the one who could do things that were hard. That's the real me. So I think that's important to know that whenever you're not in the PMS situation, that's the real you. So the real you needs to make the changes and do the things that you want to do so that when the non-real you comes along, you know, you have things already in place. Not that you're going to be able to continue everything, but they'll be in place. And it'll be once things are ingrained as habits, and once things are systematized in our lives, then it's a lot easier to keep up with them. Uh, so be what you want to be when an outside force is not controlling you. Make fasting as much of a habit as possible when you are doing well. Uh, the funny thing about fasting is that people that I've talked to who have a lot of PMS issues, they say the fasting isn't the isn't the hard part. It's once they open their eating window that they start eating everything inside and they don't stop until their window closes. And then they're fine again until the next day. And I think that speaks to the very nature of intermittent fasting. Um, we can close our window because we're full or satiated tonight because tomorrow we're going to get to eat again. And it's not the same as a diet mentality when we're constantly like, Oh, if I don't eat this now, I, tomorrow I've got to, I'm going to be doing this, this, and this, and so I won't be able to have it. So I think that, that in general, fasting actually works well with PMS in that um, we can often have short-term deprivation, even when we're having all those wacko hormones and everything. So... Um, Many people can still fast if it has been there, if it's been second nature to them already. Um, so it's usually the food choices and the amounts of food that are really affected, um, it seems to be. And also, again, just not throwing in the towel in general um, is that if you can't fast as long as you usually can, um, no, no. If you can't fast as long as you usually can during this time, do whatever you can do. Again, the important point is that whatever is, is coming over us that we feel out of control in, that we have as many things already built into our lives as we can, that we keep as many of those during this time as we possibly can, and that we, um, and that we don't throw in the towel completely that we don't let it overcome us so much that we can't do anything to get out of it. And so again, anything you have in place is going to be a help, but when it comes to intermittent fasting, if you usually fast 18 or 19 hours a day, you know, there are, are many times during my bad day or two or three that I might just say, you know what, 16, eight for two or three days and I'm fine. And it might be just the amount of leeway the wiggle room, the um, exception that you need to get through your bad PMS days. So it's the same in everything, right? It's the same whether we're fasting. It's the same whether we're just trying to develop habits. It's the same whether we're, tr uh, you know, trying to deal with PMS. Is that if we can keep some semblance of what we're trying to do and don't throw in the towel entirely by having bunches of cheat days, by never fasting anymore during that time, by just giving in entirely, then we will 
we're going to feel so much better on the other side. And so in that regard, we need to do what we can do, whatever we can do. So even like some mantras, like I will not throw in the towel. I will not give up entirely. I will not be all or nothing, you know, because there are little windows of hope during that time, right? It's not all hopeless. I mean, some people, for some people it is, and sometimes it's worse than others. I know my PMS got worse with each child. And so it got really, really hard in my, with my fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth, uh, in between my fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth pregnancies. Um, so, but whatever we can do, we hold on to, as opposed to just throwing in the towel entirely. All right. So, um, Miscellaneous ideas. Uh, number one, keep your fasting and eating windows intact as much as possible. Again, that goes back to that. Sometimes just knowing what you can have when your eating window opens is enough to get you through the fast. Use whatever regular fasting tools that you may have used or learned uh, in the course or um, on the blog or elsewhere. Uh, the pink Himalayan salt, the mineral water, the sparkling water, coffee, tea, caffeine, self-talk, five-second rule, time blocking, all the things that I've tried to teach you over the last uh, 15 months, um, use all of those tools with your PMS time. Even if they're not 100% successful anymore, right? We're, we'll go for okay, as opposed to just horrible. Uh, don't keep the worst offenders in your house. We've heard the quote. I love this quote. When you say no at the grocery, you only have to say no once. And I talked a lot about my favorite, one of my favorite books right now. I have two favorite books that you guys have heard me talk about. The Hungry Brain by Dr. Stephen Guillenet and Atomic Habits by James Clear. And in The Hungry Brain, he, we talk, he talks, and I've talked a lot on the broadcast, about barriers. So making barriers between us and the things that are more addictive, the more seductive foods, my trifecta, as I like to call it. So um, for me, this has meant, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I like a good deal and efficiency too. So I would always order these miniature Dove candy bars and not the tiny ones, okay, the miniature ones, and then miniature bags of M&M peanuts on Amazon in this big, in this big, really, really big bag. And, um, and it was because I wanted the smaller packages and I wanted to get a good deal. So for me, the, a barrier that I have made in the last few months is not ordering that anymore. You know, if I'm, if I really, 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 you know, feel a need to have peanut M&Ms, it has to be I have to go out and get them. I have to go to the gas station. I have to buy a package and not the king size, right? So the, the barrier is huge when it comes to food choices. And yes, we might, during our PMS, we might get in our car, we might drive through Dunkin' Donuts, and we might get two Dunkin' Donuts and two donuts and two chocolate milks, but we created a barrier by not having a dozen of them in our home. And it took more effort to go get that. And that might cause us instead to eat something less seductive and still maybe, you know, overcome that um, need. All right. So, again, I already said don't start uh, new things. Uh, take advantage of the good days. Use the same techniques as, um, as you do in trying to lower your cortisol levels. And I forgot to put down the broadcast number. Um, I will say that at DonnaReach.com, um, my tech girl has um, an index for all of the broadcasts, the, the big weekly broadcasts like this, and then the fast shots. And when you click on that, you can see thumbnails and all the topics that are in each of the broadcasts. So go to the one about lowering cortisol if you want more help with this. But um, some of the same techniques as we talked about in lowering cortisol can be applied to PMS. So meditation, yoga, deep breathing, instrumental music, sunlight, nature, walking, things you love that are not food related, a journaling, gratitude journal or list, prayer, reading, right? So um, I don't want to seem trite in that, but those things do help in lowering cortisol levels. And if we are doing those at any of those as established um, 
things in our lives, you know, routines, established routines and habits in our lives, then it will be easier to continue them even during this time. And uh, they can certainly help, uh, help too. We need to find other ways to raise our, um, to lower our stress hormones and our stress levels and our anxiety and the things associated with PMS and to raise our serotonin levels um, besides the, um, super, super, super seductive foods that will cause us to gain weight and will cause us um, to crave because once we have those seductive foods, we want them again and again and again. Um, so anyway, those you can find out more about that in the cortisol one. And plan and prepare ahead of time with your strategies and with your foods. Now, <clears throat> I have a long list of food ideas and um, I feel like I really have to give a caveat that uh, most of these food ideas not necessarily the sugar-free things because I, I usually have sugar-free things anytime, but the other things are not things that, like I don't recommend that we have vanilla wafers with frosting um, day, as our daily fare. But when if we have vanilla wafers with sugar-free or homemade frosting at home during PMS, instead of going through the drive through and getting the aforementioned two donuts and two chocolate milks, we're gonna have a better weight outcome, right? And sometimes that is what it's going to take to help us be able to have that monthly weight loss or monthly weight maintenance as opposed to either just, like if we're overweight, staying the same or even gaining. So um, these are not ideal food scenarios. These are PMS food scenarios. All right. Um, so uh, again, if you've been controlled by if you've been controlled by your monthly cycle, simply telling you not to eat sugar or to eat less sugar will not work. So plan for it. Think if I have to have processed foods right now, sugar, sugary or savory, so crispy, I meant savory, sugary or savory, what is the best worst thing I can have? Right. And those of you who have done like Weight Watchers before. And um, anybody who did the whole, you know, Jane Fonda, Denise Austin era where we were, you know, trying to lower our fat and all that. Um, I don't think that it's a good idea to have no fat. I, I don't think that's a good idea in general. I mean, I have certain fats that I always have because they're healthier and I feel better and they're satiating. And I've talked about the different foods, the different car, uh, macronutrients in other broadcasts and which ones are more satiating and so forth and why. Um, however, during this PMS time, we have to remember that if our goal is to try not to gain weight during the PMS time, but, and we're still going to eat something that's less than desired, less than perfect, or less than great for our bodies. We are better off eating something that is lower in fat. Because, remember I talked about this in calorie cycling, because fat has nine calories per gram, and carbohydrates and protein have four. So one of the ways that we can overcome that gaining weight every time every month when we have our monthly cycle is by picking the best worst foods that we can and i and it sounds like a cop-out but it's not a cop-out because when you're in the middle of that and you don't feel like you have the control how much better off are you going to be having eaten strawberries with uh sugar-free dip than you are eating a cupcake, right, or something packaged. So think about the best worst, all right, the best worst. I know that doesn't really go together grammatically. So for me, that sweets that do not have my trifecta. They do not have all three. They don't have flour, sugar, and fat, all three. So it might be a candy bar or it might be peanut M&Ms because I'm way better off with the 200 calorie bag of peanut M&Ms as far as just looking at it from a weight standpoint, not nutritional standpoint. I'm way better with a 240 calorie bag of peanut M&Ms than I am with a 600 calorie cream filled uh, roll just from a weight standpoint. All right. And savory food that isn't so fatty. So a chicken quesadilla over four meat pizza. 
bake chips and salsa over chips and queso. So that's why I said think back to those days of Weight Watchers and, um, and you know, the low fat craze, because those could really come in handy right now. If you're going, if we're going to not be able to overcome all of the things that are happening to us and all the sugar cravings and so forth, let's make the best worst choice. All right, so I recommend that you make a list of lower fat, lower calorie, lower sugar foods that you think would still satisfy your monster cravings. And um, personally, I use a lot of my sugar-free treats at the blog. Uh, they have um, natural sweeteners, stevia, and erythritol blend in them, and that really helps me a lot. Um, but maybe that isn't what's going to help you. But again, think in terms of how am I going to come out of this uh, without a weight gain. Sometimes that's what it's. Sometimes that's what it boils down to during the wrong time of the month. All right, use non-addictive treats during this time as the addictive properties will only be enhanced and more desired, right? So we, if we are in fact trying to raise serotonin levels, and if carbohydrates will raise serotonin levels uh, for us and help us during this PMS time, then does it have to be, you know, a, a donut or a little Debbie? Or can it be, you know, a baked potato or vanilla wafers with cream cheese dip, or apples with cream cheese dip. I mean, you know, what does it need to be to get me through without a weight gain and without too much nutritional damage? <laughs> All right, so here are some examples of treats that are lower in calories and fat so that even if you overeat on them during your cycle, it won't result in weight gaining weight as easily. And I put a um, another, caveat here. I keep on I keep on writing that note. I'm only recommending this as an alternative to eating a quarter chunky monkey or a family size bag of M&Ms. I really think real foods as much as possible is the way to go. So, but when I can't, these are some ideas. Fruit with sugar-free jello or puddings. There are healthy ones with stevia or erythritol available on Amazon if you don't want to use like Splenda or NutraSweet ones. Um, uh, Anytime you do fruit over calorie dense sweets, you're increasing your fiber. Your hi Donna, hi hi Teresa, thank you. You are increasing your fiber. You're um, uh, controlling your stomach distensibility because you're going to fill that distensibility up with fiber instead of with something else. All right. And uh, your water from fruits take up the stomach space. So I've talked about this a lot before, but this also applies to PMS. So you have uh, a bag of M&Ms. And you, I talk a lot about M&Ms, peanut M&Ms. So you have a bag of peanut M&Ms, and they're this big. And there are 240 calories in them. Or you have three apples for 240 calories. Okay, so let's just say I don't have, let's say that this is a hand sanitizer. My husband's half-day student, see. They have colds a lot. <laughs> so anyway, they um, you have this little bag of M&Ms and you have these three apples here. All right, this has nothing to do with cravings during PMS. <laughs> All right, so this doesn't fill up very much of your stomach. You just have this, you know, when you take the M&Ms out of the bag and you have 240 calories, they, they're, it's not that full, it's not that many. Three apples on the other hand is like this. And then we have, not only do we have the volume from the fruit, but we also have the fiber in the peeling. Don't peel them. We also have the fiber in the peeling. We also have the water. And there's no fiber and there's no water and there's no bulk in our peanut M&Ms. So that was just a free lesson that sort of fits. <laughs> All right. So uh, that stomach dispensability. So granted, a lot of times during PMS, you're not thinking about how full your stomach is. You're not thinking about, oh, I'm so full, I can't eat another bite. Unfortunately, those are not the things that are happening during PMS. But um, it's always better to fill our stomachs up with fibrous, water, watery foods um, because they're so nutrient dense, first of all. And then they're also going to take up the space that we could use for something else in general that might not happen if you're having a really bad PMS time but okay so fruit with sugar-free dips puddings jellos can help with the sugar desire while meeting some of the above benchmarks because you're bringing food you're bringing fruit into it as well all right then sweets that are less addictive to you normally so what typically 
are less addictive type of sweets, like low sugar, low fat muffins. Um, uh, I use like sprouted flour and um, and um, a, a healthy sugar free sweetener. Make banana muffins, that type of thing. Um, I also use my sugar free and cream, sugar free cream cheese whip and dessert base. I use this a lot. Um, made with lower fat cream cheese and true whip topping, which is real whipped cream, uh, with crispy lower fat sweets. So vanilla wafers or graham crackers, fruit, sugar free pie filling, peanut butter powder made into peanut butter mixed with that. Um, all of these are going to be less calorie dense. And again, right now we're only talking about coming out of this without gaining weight while still uh, getting some semblance of control by not having those seductive foods. All right, make your own less sugary treats. And again, this is if you have, if you're preparing for your PMS and you have, you know, cream cheese dessert bay, base and you have some of these muffins and you have um, another thing that I didn't put on here that I really like to have is my sprouted bread with low sugar jelly you know if you have nothing else in the house that you can um that you can have you don't have any of those seductive foods that you really really want during pms you don't have any of those all of a sudden you turn to graham crackers with some cream cheese base or apple with apple dip or vanilla wafers with melted sugar-free chocolate because maybe you keep that in the house or toast a sprouted toast with jelly so you have done, you've had been able to satisfy this intense PMS craving with something less seductive, less calorie dense, and even with some redeeming nutrient qualities. All right, now you want to do the same thing with savory treats during this time. So ask yourself what will ward off these feelings and cravings with the least amount of damage calorie wise and craving wise. Right. And we're not always in our right mind during this time. So that's why all the plan ahead uh, uh, advice here. All right. Um, so think less fat, savory, uh, lesser fat, savory, um, because total caloric intake does matter when it's all said and done. Right. So that's why we fast. And we skim calories off the top. Right. That's why people who are trying to lose their last 20 pounds with intermittent fasting, either bring in another protocol to finish it or they eat like an 80 20 where they're eating 80 percent real foods 20 percent uh, party foods as we like to call them reach party foods they're doing something to get that caloric down level down uh, to what you need so if you love pretzels or cheese it's you'll do a lot less damage calorie wise than you will with chips and dips um, and part of what you are after right now is not gaining during your cycle and undoing everything you've done before all right, and a few more food tips. I'm going long again. Make lists, okay? List on your phone of lower seductive calorie sweets, lower, uh, lower seductive calorie savory. Purchase these ahead of time. Try to go with something off this list before going off the rails entirely. Again, you've got the barrier in place. So start with the, in your list. You can even make your list in, in like order of, you know, like at the top, like, you know, a banana, apple with dip, you know, strawberry with my cream cheese base. And you get that, that sweet list. And the top is, I'm going to go to these first. As soon as I'm out of control, as soon as these things are happening to me, I'm going to go to this list first. And then I'm going to move on down to my vanilla wafers or graham crackers or whatever, still less seductive. And then if I have to have something else, I'm going to have to leave the house to go get it. I've got the barriers in place. And, um, it might just be enough to uh, keep us on our straight and narrow path. So anyway, I know this has been long. and I have uh, today's sponsor um, commercial still coming up, but I hope that this uh, was enlightening to you that I wish somebody had told me this 30 years ago. If somebody had told me this 30 years ago, maybe I could have had those food lists in my phone. Maybe I could have been prepared. Maybe I could have really ridden the waves of my good days. And, and, you know, really, really prepared for the bad. Maybe I would be more cognizant of what was happening. And I wouldn't let it take me down for two full weeks. I could kind of see the little pockets, the light maybe after three or four days, and then how it got better. Um, you know, maybe I could plan my food ahead. Maybe I could, you know, create my barriers. Maybe things would have been different for me. Somebody had told me some things that 
I'm telling you guys now, right? Um, and, and you know that, you know how important that is to me. You know how important it is that I have this information and it's helping me and it's changing my life. So how can I help other people change their lives with this information? So thank you so much for joining me for broadcast number 45. Uh, comment below or message me or email me if you have any questions or concerns or if I can help you in any way. I'm about to switch over to my sponsor for the today, which is, and I forgot my bottle, it's Plexus BioClean. So I'll see you in the next one. If you don't want to hang around for the commercial, if you want to hang around, I'm going to talk about magnesium. So anyway, thanks. All right. For those of you who are staying for our Plexus commercial, today's sponsor is BioCleanse. And BioCleanse is a magnesium supplement. So I have some good magnesium info for you and some great BioCleanse info for you. Many of you have heard our testimony, how we've lost 150 pounds together in the two and a half years that we've been using plant-based supplementation. And um, two thirds of that was through was once we adapted intermittent fasting. And I really feel like the healthy supplementation really got our guts healthy, got us in with better habits, and continue to help us be able to maintain the lifestyle that we want to eventually get to our goal weight. So um, BioCleanse is our magnesium product. And Plexus has 22 plant-based products. They are all either plants or botanicals. They're all natural. And they address different concerns. So out of the 22, you know, maybe six of them directly or indirectly affect weight. And then we have our pain relief, whether it's nerve or inflammatory types of pains. And then we have our vitamins and our um, uh, uh, omegas, and we have kids' vitamins and so forth. So uh, BioCleanse is one of the three in the triplex. If you've heard me talk about the triplex, it's our slim, our BioCleanse, and our probiotic. So that is our triplex, and that is what my husband and I started on, and that was the beginning of turning around a lot of things for me, including a severe three-a-day diet coke addiction, um, restless leg syndrome, um, GERD, insomnia, just uh, my husband got to go off blood pressure medicine. So it was that triplex that actually uh, was what we began with and what really, really turned us around. So this BioCleanse is a magnesium supplement plus. So that's the way it is with most Plexus products. They have, you know, whatever they are, like in our probiotic, ProBio5, it's got our probiotic, it's got um, uh, um Probiotic, ProBio5 has our probiotic, our digestive enzymes, and our antifungals. So three things in one. So that's the way most of our products are. With BioCleanse, it has uh, magnesium, vitamin C, um, bioflavonoids. Um, so it's also a multi-ingredient, multi-purpose product. So in general, magnesium is a big topic. It's talked about a lot. Um, you see memes and graphics. I've seen some graphics that say that uh, 80 to 90 percent of all the way up to 90 percent. I've seen something say 90 percent of people are uh, magnesium deficient. Um, I think that's probably a stretch. So uh, the statistics that I'm seeing are more like 50 percent. Uh, in general and more like 70 to 80 percent for like senior citizens so there is a problem I mean there is a there is a deficiency and I know I had a severe deficiency in it and it affected my vitamin D I was severely deficient in vitamin D also um, and uh, because it has uh, an effect on your absorption of vitamin D too so you know if we are magnesium deficient and we think we're getting all sunny and everything, and we think we're getting our vitamin D in, and we're probably not really absorbing that well if we have a magnesium deficiency. So magnesium ions, ions, I forgot to look that up, draw water into the intestine, helping to remove unnecessary or harmful substances. So when you are not magnesium deficient, you will be regular, probably, um, hopefully two uh, bowel movements a day, um, maybe not as many for intermittent fasters. It just depends. It's, it's you know, it should be, uh, you know, that it, at least once a day. Um, but 
uh, twice a day is even better. Um, and the deficiency of magnesium will reveal itself in the form of vitamin D deficiency, cramps, uh, those who have a lot of leg cramps, people who exercise and say, you know, that they, you know, they get shin cramps or or the arch of their foot or in the night, you know, how you get all crampy at night and you're turned and your spouse has to push on your foot and all that. Um, I remember that with that. Uh, inflammation, allergies, constipation, low energy levels, unhealthy gut issues like leaky gut, uh, yeast, candida overgrowth, and so forth. Uh, these are all uh, signs that you could possibly be deficient in magnesium. They're not, you know, doesn't mean you are, but it means that you could be. Um, I also found some studies of the effect on um, disease, and I didn't realize this. Actually, I've been a Plexus ambassador for almost three years, and I did not realize that um, uh, it had such a huge impact on disease, And um, which I guess it only makes sense because when we do need the vitamins and minerals not to be diseased, right? But I just didn't realize the effect that um, magnesium had. So this... Uh, is a meta study and if you remember from some of my talk about uh, research a meta study is a study of many studies so that's the the studies that are brought together like that are really good so keep this in mind not just with supplementation but with everything you know that you want to um, attribute an outcome or a um, result um, and definitely, if you're going to change your life, you want to attribute it to something that has been proven not just in rodents or not just in, you know, limited studies, but you want it to be something over and over again. So this was a review of 40 studies involving a total of 1 million people. And they found that every 100 milligram increase in magnesium from food reduced the risk of heart failure by 22%, type 2 diabetes by 19%, and stroke by 7%. And then it went on to explain like death rate numbers and stuff and how those went down as a result of this uh, increasing magnesium from food. And so whether you're practicing intermittent fasting or you're not, it's very difficult to get everything that you need from food. And, um, you know, we just don't eat for fuel as much as we should. You know, when you think about food for fuel, food for joy or fun and food for PMS or whatever. We don't eat in the food for fuel category enough. So um, that is where BioCleanse comes in. And uh, actually all of the Plexus supplements, they're all bioavailable. So that means that they are able to be extracted. So for example, if you're taking a vitamin and you end up with yellow pee, that means that you're peeing your vitamin out. And it's not a bioavailable vitamin. It's not sticking to you. Um, like X Factor has aloe to help it stick, help your vitamins stick to you. So if you are peeing out your vitamins, that means they're not being assimilated. All right, so the ingredients in this, vitamin C, which is great, uh, just a continual intake of vitamin C. Uh, we just seldom ever get sick and we're not down for long at all, if we ever are. I was telling somebody the other day that it's been six years, actually, since I had my appendix um, no, my gallbladder removed. It's been six years since I've been down for more than a half a day. So um, that is, and part of that time I wasn't even on Plexus. I just, um, I just really uh, blessed with a good immune, I guess, a good immune system, I guess. When I, and the remarkable thing is that I teach writing to 70 kids in person every week. So <laughs> I don't know how I kept from getting things so badly, but I'm glad I do. And now it's even better than, way better than that. I just really don't don't um so vitamin c magnesium in the form of magnesium hydroxide again the assimilated type sodium bioflavonoid complex vegetarian capsule and rice flour again nothing is um not natural nothing is unnatural in the plexus products all right so these capsules you take one or two early in the day and one or two later in the day the benefits are to cleanse the gastrointestinal tract now Plexus, in my opinion, there is a little bit of an issue with some of the names of it, like BioCleanse makes people think, especially nowadays, maybe not when they first came out with it, but nowadays when we hear about a cleanse, we think it is, you know, a cleanse that somebody is doing to um, 
empty themselves out. And so you're doing lemon water cleanses and we're doing all these different kinds of cleanses. Um, but bio cleanse does not mean that you're going to get a whoosh of a cleanse. It is just a natural, consistent magnesium intake that that helps you with regularity. So um, you can adjust the dosage according to, you know, like if you already are really regular, then you might only want to take two a day um, if you need. Uh, reduces gas, bloating, and discomfort, helps promote regularity, relieves occasional constipation, oxygenizes the blood, and reduces inflammation and pain. And I really credit this with my cramping that I used to get in the swimming pool. I used to do aqua exercises at the time that I started on these products, and I would get really bad cramps in the in the water. I had really bad restless leg syndrome at night. I was on very strong medication for that. And I really credit BioCleanse with a lot of that and also with helping my husband with his um, arthritis. So anyway, I would love to tell you more about it. But we do have a special right now, a joining special. So um, you can get wholesale pricing for free for a year without the joining fee. So um, let me know if you're interested in learning more. Thank you so much for joining me for uh, monthly cycle cravings and weight gain. And I want the very best for you.